Good afternoon to those attending in our local time zone. Good morning, good evening to everyone else tuning in from abroad. I'm truly thrilled, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome you to this very bright addition to our series of mentoring talks. We are very honored to host today Professor Luis Ignaro, the great recipient of the most prestigious accolade, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for our 27th mentoring talk and the first of year 2023. This mentoring talk is organized in part partnership with the prestigious Angewanta Kemi. I very much thank Dr. Lauren Scholz, Senior Associate Editor of Angewanta Kemi for joining me on this panel. Our distinguished guest, Professor Ignaro, is here today to narrate his story and to tell us how his failures and hurdles paved the way to his remarkable success. Growing up as curious and perceptive child, speculating about the ends of the universe, young Lewis always came up with brilliant scientific questions and investigated answering these questions through experimentation. At the age of just 10, he asked his father to stand at the end of a dark street to turn on a flashlight and to horn at the same time to observe the speed of sound versus light. Although Professor Ignaro now enjoys the honor and fame of having won a Nobel Prize, his life has not exactly been easy as he has faced a multitude of challenges. He was born to parents who were uneducated Italian immigrants and struggled with broken English since his kindergarten years. Then he was told by his high school college advisor not to get his hopes up because he would not get accepted into the university of his dreams. But to that he said, quote, I was not about to take no for an answer. It was not in my nature to give up, end of quote. And he pushed himself outside of his comfort zone and excelled. But that is not where his obstacles ended. His NIH grant application for his groundbreaking research was rejected. So were his two publications submitted to Nature. One of the referees of his grant commented, quote, the principal investigator has apparently lost his ability to focus his research on biologically relevant pharmacology. He would be better off submitting this proposal to an agency interested in air pollution. End of quote. Our esteemed guest has led groundbreaking research by discovering nitric oxide, NO, as an intravenous gaseous molecule that plays a role in a multitude of fields. Professor Ignaro's legacy is now eternalized in the stars of science. He has always dreamed big and strove to accomplish what he set his mind to, as he frequently entered the labs of renowned scientists and asked to observe them and learn from their expertise. In 1998, Professor Ignaro was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, along with two other scientists, for their discoveries in relation to nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system. In his own words, quote, I tell my graduate and medical students all the time, never give up. Pursue what you believe in. Don't allow any temporary defeat to cloud your mind or interfere with the pursuit of your goals, end of quote. Without further ado, Please welcome Professor Louis Ignaro so that we may all learn how he has managed to carve his name into the history of physiology, pharmacology, scientific endeavor, and medicine. Professor Ignaro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Bilal Ta'afarani, for a fantastic uh, introduction. And everything you said is, is absolutely true. I struggled quite a bit uh, in, in starting 
my career even before that because you see my parents were born in Italy and uh, they they moved to the United States to New York they met each other in New York uh, they did not speak English they got married and then I came along and still they were not speaking English so my English was very poor and when I started kindergarten and grade school it was very difficult for me to communicate with the teachers and the other students and so on. So that was one heck of a roller coaster ride, believe me, for the first uh, two years. But I was able to uh, persevere, studied hard, and gradually I stabilized and I did okay. And as you heard in the introduction, I also had lots of ups and downs during my research career and I will try to share some of those as I give you my presentation, which I think you will enjoy. And one of the reasons I like to give this presentation is so that I could uh, uh, stimulate and motivate young investigators, even established investigators, to, uh, to, to do research that may be a little bit outside the box. And you'll see what I mean as I go through this. I like to title this, um, th this talk, Nitric Oxide is not just a gas blowing in the wind. Nitric Oxide is a gas molecule, as many of you know. And I took this title from a, a folk song named Blowing in the Wind, which was written and sung by Bob Dylan in 1963. He was very famous in the United States, also in Europe. The words to his songs were so meaningful that, the, that he was awarded a Nobel Prize in literature uh, a few years ago. But I'm not gonna talk about Bob Dylan in this presentation. Instead, I'm gonna talk about the discovery of a vital physiological agent, namely nitric oxide. And this uh, is a very interesting molecule. Uh, it's, it's truly a miracle molecule. Now, you may not know what I'm talking about when I use that phrase now, but I'm hoping that by the time this presentation is, is finished, you will appreciate the miraculous nature of this molecule. And the next slide shows the chemistry of nitric oxide. It's a free radical, which means it has an unpaired electron. So it's looking for other molecules that have unpaired electrons so that they can react to form a stable electron pair. So nitric oxide or NO is reactive, but it's not destructive in terms of its rea reactivity. It is a free radical that enables the nitric oxide to produce lots of physiological effects, as I will explain. Many of us believe that nitric oxide is the, is the uh, most widespread signaling molecule in the body. And also many of us believe that because of that, nitric oxide is the most widespread anti-aging molecule in the body. And this will become important later. So let's step back a few years. Fred Murad, who shared in the Nobel Prize with me, discovered by accident that nitric oxide could increase the levels of a signaling molecule inside cells called cyclic GMP. And so we wondered what was the pharmacological effect of elevated cyclic GMP production in cells? As a pharmacologist, I wanted to study these things. We like to study the effects uh, of, of chemical agents on cells. And so, what Fred Murad found was that the nitric oxide in increasing cyclic GMP caused non-vascular smooth muscle relaxation. That's the airways, the trachea. And our lab, I jumped right in, and we saw that nitric oxide was able to relax vascular smooth muscle as well. And so the question came up is, how does nitric oxide elicit its effects in the body. 
The first mechanism is by stimulating the production of cyclic GMP, as I mentioned. And this turned out to be a critical signaling molecule inside cells. We learned that later. A more recent mechanism of nitric oxide does not involve cyclic GMP, but it involves a direct chemical interaction of the nitric oxide with certain components of cells, certain elements like sulfur or protein. And a good example is protein S nitrosylation, where the nitric oxide will react with a sulfur on a protein to form a covalent bond and modify the structure and the function of that protein. But first, let's look at the cyclic GMP mechanism. NO activates an enzyme. The name of the enzyme, guanylate cyclase. And this enzyme catalyzes the formation of cyclic GMP inside cells. And we'll see from the next slide how that works. Nitric oxide will activate that guanylate cyclase so that it can catalyze the conversion of GTP, guanosine triphosphate, to cyclic GMP. And so the receptor for nitric oxide is a certain binding site on the guanylate cyclase. NO attaches to it, activates the enzyme several hundred fold to increase cyclic GMP. And next, um, I want to say that it's a good thing that we smoked cigarettes back then. Let me explain, because this is how we made the important discovery that nitric oxide is a vascular smooth muscle uh, relaxant. We made an accidental finding that cigarette smoke caused profound relaxation of isolated rings of not only pulmonary artery, but also coronary artery. My graduate student, Carl was his name at the time, used to smoke cigarettes, two or three packs of cigarettes a day. In those days, you could smoke in the laboratory, you could do anything in the laboratory. And so he took these different isolated rings, isolated setups of the arteries, put them in tissue baths. We had a whole series of tissue baths, 10 or 12. And normally what you do is you let them sit in the physiological salt solution so that they equilibrate and you could see, you wait until they maintain constant tone and then you can do your experiments by adding various chemicals to the tissue baths. And when he lit up a cigarette and the smoke filled the room, some of the tissues did not maintain tone. Some of them lost tone, some of them lost a little bit of tone, many lost a lot of tone. And I said, you know, I think your smoking is killing these arteries. Please stop smoking. Now we got to start all over with the experiment and put fresh tissues there. And before we took it down, I had an idea. I said, listen, stop smoking and let's rinse or wash out these arterial preparations and let them re-equilibrate again and let's see if they maintain tone. We did that, the arteries recovered and we were all set to do our experiment for the morning. And then I said, Carl, wait, wait, why don't you go into the hallway, light up a cigarette, put the smoke in your mouth and then come in with a straw and just blow a little bit of smoke in one or two of the, of the uh, tissue chambers to see if the smoke will cause relaxation again. And that's exactly what we found. We found that there was relaxation, but the other tissue baths did not relax. But when we blew cigarette smoke into them, they relaxed. And so we were able to also, that was a reversible effect, and we were able to, to, to wash the preparation so that they worked well. Well, that was very exciting to me. And I thought, well, what in the world is in cigarette smoke that's going to cause a reversible relaxation? I went to the library and discovered that cigarette smoke contains 800 parts per million of nitric oxide gas. 
because of the combustion of the tobacco and the paper and so on. And, and, so, and the rest is history. I mean, this is how we found that nitric oxide was a profound vascular smooth muscle uh, relaxant. Uh, now, so the earliest pharmacology of nitric oxide, and this was about 1979, 1980, uh, we knew that NO is a non-vascular and vascular smooth muscle relaxant causing bronchodilation and vasodilation. And remember, as I said before, the receptor for the nitric oxide is the intracellular enzyme guanylate cyclase, which makes cyclic GMP. We then looked at nitroglycerin, and why did we do that? Nitroglycerin, as you know, is not only an explosive that Alfred Nobel used to make dynamite, but it is a very, very potent vasodilator used clinically to lower and control or regulate the blood pressure. Uh, it was a known vasodilator since the 1870s because this was discovered in Alfred Nobel's dynamite factories in Stockholm. People would come in to the factories and they breathe the air. Nitroglycerin is a volatile oil. The fumes got in the air. The workers got tremendous headaches because of the cerebral vasodilation, we learn later. But those, those workers who had angina, heart disease, they would be totally relieved of their anginal pain when they were working in the factories. But when they went home on the weekends, that pain reappeared because they were away from the nitroglycerin fumes. This is many, many years ago, 1870. And the mechanism of vasodilator action of nitroglycerin remained unknown until my laboratory figured it out. And so we thought, could nitroglycerin work by a nitric oxide cyclic GMP mechanism? And the reason we thought that is because nitric oxide is actually built in to the molecule of nitroglycerin, as you'll see on the next slide. So we wondered actually, is nitroglycerin converted to, to nitric oxide inside the vascular smooth muscle cells? And is that how we get our relaxation? So this is the chemical structure of nitroglycerin. Um, it's a very simple structure. It's uh, glycerol, as you see here, glycerol is, is a sugar. Glycerol is very sweet sugar, very safe. You can, you can eat tablespoonfuls of glycerol without there being a problem. This is used in the pharmaceutical industry to sweeten certain uh, preparations that you take. But I wanted to describe the synthesis of nitroglycerin first. If you take ordinary glycerol, but you mix it with concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid and heat it up, you wind up with tri-nitroglycerol, okay? This is a very simple reaction. It does, there's no requirements. The only requirement for this reaction is that it be done carefully in the laboratory. So let's go on to the next slide to see how nitroglycerin works. What we did is we took nitroglycerin and we incubated it with, with vascular smooth muscle preparations. And what we found under the right conditions is that the nitroglycerin is converted to nitric oxide and also dinitroglycerol. You can see this reaction. So Nitroglycerin was metabolized by the tissues to NO. NO was a very, very potent vascular smooth muscle relaxant. The other compound, the dinitro alcohol, is very, very weak. So we concluded that the active vasodilator principle in nitroglycerin was nitric oxide. In, in another experiment, uh, there was another graduate student of mine who was interested in learning more about platelet aggregation and blood clotting. And he had seen in the literature that sodium nitroprusside, which is a nitrovasodilator, which dilates the blood vessels through a nitric oxide mechanism, also inhibited platelet aggregation. And so we decided to study 
authentic nitric oxide, and we found that NO inhibited platelet aggregation by stimulating cyclic GMP inside the platelets. And we didn't realize how important this effect was going to turn out to be for many years later. So in 1980, here's the pharmacology of nitric oxide. It's a smooth muscle relaxant. Uh, it improves local or regional blood flow. It inhibits blood clotting and thrombosis. And all of these effects are mediated by cyclic GMP. Now, we thought, well, what is the physiological relevance of nitric oxide? Uh, let me explain. At this point in time, nitric oxide was not known to exist in mammalian species, right? We're talking about an outside chemical, an air pollutant. And it was well known to be a pollutant gas in the Earth's atmosphere. Not known or even suspected to be present endogenously in mammals. No one was thinking about nitric oxide as a naturally occurring signaling molecule. We were just studying the pharmacology of nitric oxide gas, which you could buy in a cylinder and test it in the uh, laboratory. And we had an early dilemma. For example, even though the pharmacology was so exciting that some of us thought, gee, you know, maybe NO might exist in cells, and that would explain its potent effects on platelets and blood vessels. But the chemistry of nitric oxide revealed that it was highly unlikely to exist, much less function in mammalian cells. NO is very unstable. It has a half-life of two or three seconds. It's highly reactive with other molecules. And so how could it exist long enough in tissues to produce an effect? But wait, not so fast, I used to tell my research group. We used to ask each other these questions. Why would a purely exogenous air pollutant be such a potent vasodilator? You know, nitric oxide works down to the picomolar range. Picomolar, not nanomolar, but picomolar. That's very potent. Also, why would well-defined receptors for nitric oxide exist in cells? That, that didn't make any sense. So we thought maybe it's possible NO does exist in cells. Maybe cells have evolved to develop receptors for nitric oxide in cells, such as the one on guanoate cyclase, so that NO could activate the enzyme, elevate cyclic GMP, and cause relaxation. This certainly would explain the physiological relevance of the NO cyclic GMP system, because without it, what's the relevance? Why do we have cyclic GMP if we don't have nitric oxide? Does that make sense to anybody? I, I don't think so, not to us. But in the meanwhile, a separate discovery was made that appeared to have nothing to do with NO. The mechanism of vasodilation of acetylcholine remained a mystery for nearly 100 years until the discovery of endothelium-derived relaxing factor, or EDRF. And I'd like to explain this to you because this is just fascinating. It's a fascinating example that, that, that demonstrates how discoveries are made. So Bob Furchgott made this discovery in 1980. He also shared in the Nobel Prize. What he found, and I'm going to, I'm going to use a cartoon of a cross section of an artery to describe this. The blood is flowing on the left side, that's the lumen. You have a single layer of endothelial cells in the middle, separating the blood from the smooth muscle cells, and there are multiple layers of smooth muscle cells. So here's what Bob Furchgott found. When he added acetylcholine to this preparation, he got relaxation of the smooth muscle. If, if you take away the endothelial cells, there's going to be no relaxation. 
because the relaxation by acetylcholine is endothelium dependent, okay? So what he found was that when he added acetylcholine, something was generated in the endothelium, some relaxing factor that somehow moved over to the vascular smooth muscle to cause relaxation. He did not know what EDRF was. So he called it endothelium-derived relaxing factor. We reproduced his findings, and then we asked, we wanted to determine what EDRF was. So we started off by making certain measurements. We measured cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP because we knew how to measure those, and we knew that cyclic GMP was involved in relaxation, and we knew that cyclic AMP was also involved in relaxation. For example, epinephrine or adrenaline and other such catecholamines produce relaxation through a cyclic AMP mechanism. When we did those experiments, we found that acetylcholine elevated only cyclic GMP, and you can show that now. Only cyclic GMP went up. Ah, very interesting. So then we asked the question, is cyclic GMP causing the relaxation? Or is it just going up for some other reason? And so we tested a known inhibitor of cyclic GMP formation. And the name of this is methylene blue. Methylene blue inhibits guanylate cyclase, thereby blocking cyclic GMP formation. When we tested methylene blue in the system, we found that not only cyclic GMP was blocked, but relaxation was blocked. So therefore, this suggested that EDRF was <clears throat> elevating cyclic GMP in order to cause relaxation. If cyclic GMP was going up, that meant that guanylate cyclase had to be present in the vascular smooth muscle cells. We identified that. And then we did another experiment, which was very difficult to do, but we were able to do it. We wanted to determine whether EDRF, even though we didn't know what it was, if EDRF could activate GC, guanylate cyclase. So again, in, in, a, in, in a trying series of experiments, we found that EDRF could activate guanylate cyclase to elevate cyclic GP, cause relaxation, and again, methylene blue could block this. At this time, we realized that the properties of EDRF appear to be very similar to the properties of nitric oxide, right? Both elevate cycle GMP to cause relaxation. If you block cycle GMP, you block relaxation to EDRF and NO. NO does not require the endothelium to relax. NO is a small lipid-soluble molecule, diffuses through the membranes, goes right to the smooth muscle to cause relaxation. The endothelium is not required. So our conclusion based on all of this was that EDRF must be nitric oxide. What else could it be? And so we did a series of chemical experiments, and after a few months, we identified, we isolated and identified EDRF as nitric oxide. And so now we can change EDRF to NO. We don't have to refer to uh, EDRF anymore because now we knew that this EDRF was nitric oxide. And this was the uh, very first demonstration that nitric oxide exists in and can be produced by mammalian cells. So you see, it took, it took several people actually to make this observation. If Bob Furchgott did not discover EDRF, we may not have discovered that nitric oxide because we'd ha we would have nothing to, <laughs> to test at to determine if that substance is nitric oxide. So although we were working completely independently separate laboratories 3,000 miles apart, nevertheless, people's research can come together. 
uh, when they're looking at different aspects of the research. So you have to have an open mind and watch what's going on and try to draw conclusions as these experiments are going by. Now, a couple of years after we showed that the uh, blood vessels could make nitric oxide, uh, Saul Snyder's group in Johns Hopkins University actually showed the enzyme that can produce nitric oxide. And that, that was a really brilliant discovery. And so this looked complicated, but it's not. Uh, let me just say that uh, the, the, the substrate for this NO synthase enzyme is arginine, the common basic amino acid arginine present everywhere. So in the presence of the NO synthase, the arginine is first converted to an intermediate called N-hydroxyarginine, which is then converted to nitric oxide plus a very important set second product of the reaction, and that's citrulline. So uh, mechanistically, if, if you can click it once, this group, th this amino group here, is first oxidized to form N-hydroxyarginine, and then the enzyme also will uh, uh, cause this to cleave off and oxidize this carbon to form a carbonyl. This is citrulline. This is citrulline. And the NO comes off as NO, as nitric oxide. So you can see that uh, this is the NO synthase uh, reaction. It's very complicated. I'm only describing it to you in a terse fashion, but it, believe me, it's very complicated, and people are still uh, studying this. But that is how nitric oxide is formed in the body, and the absolute requirement for nitric oxide to be formed in the body is the amino acid arginine. But now we have an additional help. If you look down below, you see that citrulline, the second product in the reaction, that is readily converted by two enzymes back to arginine. It's a recycling pathway. So as soon as the citrulline is formed, it makes more arginine, and you have more arginine to make more nitric oxide and more citrulline. And the citrulline goes back, and you have this circle where you keep getting nitric oxide formation. And personally, I believe that this is extremely important physiologically because the cell tried, the endothelial cell tries to do whatever it can do to maintain the constant and continuous production of NO. You don't ever want the endothelial cell production to fall, ever. No good reason for that. And so here's a way in which you can really uh, drive that reaction and just maintain that level of arginine so it can keep making NO. I, I, I don't know about you, but I think Mother Nature is fantastic. So let's uh, show this more realistically on, on this other cartoon. On the bottom, uh, well, throughout the slide, nitric oxide is made from the single layer of endothelial cells, okay? And the nitric oxide can diffuse through the membranes to get into the smooth muscle layers, the medial layer, to relax the vascular smooth muscle. That's what NO does. But also NO, on the right side, can diffuse through toward the lumen and can affect the, the uh, luminal side of the endothelial cell so that platelets cannot adhere to the surface, to the internal surface. In other words, it's blocking platelet adhesion and platelet aggregation. That nitric oxide also prevents white blood cells and other cells from getting into the uh, medial later because you don't want to develop inflammation, atherosclerosis, cholesterol plaques, and so on. NO is very protective. Finally, nitric oxide could diffuse right into the blood. But as soon as nitric oxide gets into the blood and into the blood cell, red blood cell, it's 95% of it is destroyed by oxyhemoglobin. In other words, NO produces a local effect where it is released. It does not produce a vasodilator effect downstream. However, in the last 10 or 15 years, there were some beautiful studies published showing that 
some of that nitric oxide that gets into the red blood cell can bind to sulfhydryl groups on hemoglobin and become stabilized. And that hemoglobin in the red blood cell can travel downstream to distant sites that need oxygen. And under those anoxic conditions, the nitric oxide is released to dilate the arteries and then more oxygen is released. And this dramatically improves tissue oxygenation. So there's a new role for nitric oxide going in, into the blood. It's really a fascinating molecule. So we're talking about the cardiovascular system. Now, a couple of years later, we made the discovery that nitric oxide is the principal neurotransmitter mediating erectile function in men. Now, why in the world did we even study that? I'm not a urologist. I'm not a neuroscientist. But one of my urology colleagues at UCLA came over to me and said, Lou, what's the neurotransmitter that causes penile erection? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not a urologist. I'm not a neuroscientist. You tell me. And he says, you know, it's, it's not known. But uh, do you think it could be nitric oxide or cyclic GMP? And I said, no, 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 because uh, th those molecules don't possess any of the criteria you need to label something a neurotransmitter. So then I thought about it for a couple of weeks and I decided once again, you know, it's time to think outside the box. Just because the criteria don't match other neurotransmitters, what does that mean? Maybe there are different kinds of neurotransmitters that have their own criteria. So I went to the library. In those days, the internet did not exist. So I spent a lot of hours in the library. So I went to the library to look at the nervous system, the nerves that innervate the corpus cavernosum or erectile tissue. And I found that they were special nerves. They were called non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerves, abbreviated NANC nerves. And um, they were named for what they're not. They don't release norepinephrine and they don't release acetylcholine. Right? So they're non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic. What the transmitter was, was not known. Uh, okay, so then I come across another paper that same afternoon by a friend of mine in England, Sir John Garthwaite. And he showed that NANC nerves exist in the brain, and maybe they release nitric oxide to improve memory and learning. And I thought, oh, if the NANC nerves in the brain can release NO, why couldn't the NANC nerves in the periphery, in the corpus cavernosum, also release NO? That would make sense because NO is a vasodilator and penile erection is all about vasodilation. And so I ran upstairs to talk to my urologist. Within weeks, we set up these preparations in the laboratory and to make a long story short, we showed unequivocally that nitric oxide is the neurotransmitter uh, that causes penile erection. And we published these observations in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's the only paper I ever published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, this newspaper, this newspaper is, um, uh, many people follow it. The, the, the TV, radio, magazines, and so on. So that day I got all kinds of interviews, telephone calls. I got an interview by the New York Times, which published the, the, uh, the results of the work that I had published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And as you can see, this article m made the left-hand column of the front page of the New York Times. In fact, we had a better spot than President Bush had <laughs> that day when he was visiting Japan. I mean, I, I thought that was pretty good for a pharmacologist making a discovery. A similar article appeared in an Italian newspaper, uh, and I can tell you that Italians dis express themselves sometimes better in pictures than in words. And so in that article was a cartoon, which is on the next slide. 
and it shows a man in bed with his lady, and he's wearing a nitric oxide gas tank. And this is in Italy. So the words are actually uh, ossido d'azoto, which means oxide of nitrogen or nitric oxide in Italian. And, uh, you know, I, I thought the slide was uh, very, very, very humorous. Uh, everyone did except for my mother. She did not appreciate seeing that slide. Well, right after uh, we published those observations in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the journal Science saw fit to declare nitric oxide as molecule of the year. And so this is important now. What happened six years later? We made the observation in 1992. In 1998, Pfizer released sildenafil or Viagra. And Viagra was fast-tracked by the FDA in the United States. And the reason this was important is because my work showing that nitric oxide is the neurotransmitter is what enabled Pfizer to make their drug. And they always acknowledge that and talk to me about that. Viagra works by increasing the actions of cycle GMP and nitric oxide. Viagra is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Phosphodiesterase destroys cycle GMP. If you inhibit the destruction of cycle GMP, you allow it to accumulate. You see, people with erectile dysfunction don't make a lot of cycle GMP. So you want that cycle GMP to accumulate in order to produce an erectile response. Now, you cannot get any erectile response without nitric oxide because you need the nitric oxide to stimulate cycle GMP formation. And that's why we say that Viagra works by increasing both cycle GMP and NO. Let's look at the dates more carefully. In March of 98 was the marketing of Viagra. But just six months later, just six months later, in October of 1998, the Nobel Prize for nitric oxide was announced. You know, you look at this and you wonder, I wondered, was this a coincidence? I mean, the Nobel Prize for nitric oxide comes just a few months after the marketing of Viagra. What was the connection there? And so I decided to look up the committee members for the Nobel Committee for Physiology or Medicine. And I recognized that the majority of the committee members were men over the age of 60. So that's how we come up with that. Of course, we're very happy about the Nobel Prize and really don't care what the real reason is for that Nobel Prize being awarded. And so on the next slide, it shows uh, uh, me receiving the Nobel Prize from King Carl Gustav in Stockholm, Sweden. And this was on December 10th, uh, 1998 in, in Stockholm, Sweden. And I like to show this slide because I like to see myself getting the prize for sure. But the main reason is I want you to, to look at what the king and I are standing on. If you look carefully, you see we are standing on N-O nitric oxide. It's just impossible to get away from nitric oxide, no matter how hard you try. Every, every year, the Nobel Committee makes a poster about that particular Nobel Prize. Here, it's about nitric oxide, and it shows Fred Murad on the left, myself in the middle. Fre uh, I'm sorry, Bob Furch got on the left, myself in the middle, Fred Murad on the right side, who shared in the Nobel Prize. In the middle, there's a heart, and there, we're looking at sections of coronary artery on the left side and the right side of the slide. On the left slide, that artery is making lots of nitric oxide, is staying healthy, there's no cholesterol plaques, the lumen is very wide, there's no inflammation, lots of blood is flowing through, and that artery probably came from a healthy individual following healthy lifestyle. 
On the other hand, the artery in the right side, as you can see, is, is a rather thick artery. We have lots of cholesterol plaques. The endothelial cell lining is destroyed. It's making very, very little nitric oxide. So the nitric oxide cannot protect the artery against disease. Also, we showed a while back that nitric oxide inhibits the growth of vascular smooth muscle cells. So if you have less nitric oxide, you have an overgrowth of the vascular smooth muscle cells, which begin to grow into the lumen, okay, and clog up the, the, the uh, uh, artery. Now, right where your, your pointer is, right there, it's hard to see. This is a photo just below the artery. This is a, a photo of a, an infant, an infant born with persistent pulmonary hypertension who is dying, that's it. And he is being given inhaled nitric oxide gas, which just started to be used at about this time. And I'm going to discuss this uh, in a minute. So let's go on to the next slide. So there have been some new advances since the Nobel Prize made. Therapeutically, NO is used as a gas administered by, administered by inhalation. And we call that INO, inhaled nitric oxide. So INO is used to treat newborns that I just showed you with persistent pulmonary hypertension. And I will explain that. But more recently, and this is really fascinating, INO is used to treat patients with COVID-19 and start with PPHN. As you know, when the fetus is developing, blood does not circulate through the lungs. It only goes through the placenta, placental circulation for oxygen. And at birth, anatomical changes occur and the blood flow is diverted to the lungs to pick up oxygen. But in the infants with PPHN, those anatomical changes do not occur for some reason, and blood does not circulate through the lungs. And the result is that the babies turn blue in color, and this can be fatal due to pulmonary hypertension and hypoxemia. And so the inhaled nitric oxide, and you only need a little bit of it, 50 parts per million or less will work. So the most you need is about 0.005% nitric oxide gas in air or oxygen, which is very safe. So what happens is that NO enters the lungs and causes selective pulmonary artery dilation. Remember, the NO, if it leaks, when it leaks into the blood, is inactivated by oxyhemoglobin, so it does not produce systemic vasodilation. You don't get a drop in systemic blood pressure. You get a drop only in pulmonary arterial pressure, which is what you want in these uh, infants. And so the result is a prompt drop in pulmonary blood pressure, increase in uh, blood flow, and a dramatic increase in blood oxygenation. Babies turn from blue to pink color. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm not a physician. I'm a researcher, PhD. My good friend Warren Zapal, who passed away a few years ago at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, pioneered all of this inhaled nitric oxide therapy for uh, PPHN and also for treating COVID. I went to visit him one day in the lab and he said, Lou, why don't you come into the NICU, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit with me? I want to show you how we're going to give inhaled nitric oxide to uh, a, a newborn who uh, has PPHN. So I dress up, I go in to the NICU, and I see this tiny baby, just so blue in color, uh, it, it was frightening. And then uh, Warren says, Lou, watch this. And he starts giving the... The, the infant, the inhaled nitric oxide. And literally, within minutes, the infant turns from a blue color to a pink color right before my eyes. Uh, and needless to say, that brought tears to my eyes, and I just couldn't believe the uh, miraculous nature of this inhaled nitric oxide uh, gas. So 
let's remember that NO has antimicrobial actions. This has been known for some time. It can interact with viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi, and so on. And through a, 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 some direct chemical interactions, mostly protein S nitrosylation, next slide, will inhibit the replication of these viruses and bacteria or kill them. And one of them is the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 in COVID-19. And the mechanism of action is simply by forming covalent bonds with certain proteins that are necessary for survival uh, in, these, um, in, in these viruses. And so let's look at inhaled NO to treat COVID-19. First of all, how do these patients die? COVID-19 patients die from inflammation and thrombosis in the lungs. The coronavirus, as you know, attaches to the lung tissue and destroys many tissues, especially the vascular endothelial cells. The vascular endothelial cells line all the arteries, which are the cells that make the nitric oxide. It's only the endothelial cells that make the nitric oxide. So if you destroy the endothelium, you destroy the capacity to make nitric oxide. This results in thrombosis, hypoxemia, and death. So it is a nitric oxide problem. And the inhaled nitric oxide replaces the endothelium-derived nitric oxide to reduce inflammation and thrombosis. And so uh, I, during the COVID pandemic, I have published some papers, done a few podcasts and television shows to try to get people to breathe correctly during the COVID-19 pandemic because of this. The nasal mucosa produces large amounts of nitric oxide gas that was shown years ago by a group at the Karolinska. The mouth does not produce nitric oxide. So if you inhale through the nose, you will bring nasal NO deep into the lungs. You cannot do this through the mouth because the mouth does not bring in NO into the lungs. So if you want to get NO into your lungs, you have to inhale through your nose. So the inhaled NO will cause bronchodilation. Remember NO relaxes airway smooth muscle, get more oxygen in the lungs. The inhaled NO will cause vasodilation. You get more blood into the lungs. And the inhaled NO, very importantly, will inhibit the replication and growth of the coronavirus. And so that you can, you can increase the oxygenation of the blood and you can inhibit the thrombosis and you can prevent the, the death of the individuals. And many clinical trials have been done. And the last one uh, was a group of pregnant women that were very seriously ill, brought into the intensive care unit. They were at various stages of pregnancy and were given inhaled nitric oxide. The result of the trial was that every single pregnant mother survived, completely cured of COVID-19, and their babies were born perfectly healthy and are now living perfectly healthy. And, you know, I, I find that to be amazing. And that's why in my last slide, I just have to say that after 40 years of basic and clinical research, I've concluded that nitric oxide is truly the miracle molecule of life and longevity. And I, I just can't have it any other way. I'm going to stop here and I want to thank you so, so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ignaro, for this beautiful presentation and for uh, telling us so many inspiring stories. Um, on behalf of all attendees, I would like uh, to thank you. Uh, I ask uh, the attendees to enter their questions in the chat box, indicate where you are from, what do you do? And I will be reading the questions and Professor Ignaro uh, will answer these uh, uh, questions. I want to say that uh, Professor Ignaro was so kind to autograph two copies of his seminal book, Dr. No. I so much enjoyed reading this book. I know all of these stories. I uh, I like that you showed that uh, cartoon, which is already, uh, which is also included in your book. Um, <laughs> one copy of this book is available in the AUB library and the other book uh, 
uh, is so dear to me. It's here on my desk. And uh, I know all of uh, uh, the, the stories here. I know that a student in my team, um, Celine Mahdi, um, she actually read the book and uh, she updated the entire uh, team on every detail in that book. So uh, there will be so many questions related to your book. So I will uh, take uh, questions right now. Uh, or actually, we will start first with Lina Hajid Diab. She is majoring in nutrition here at AUB. Um, she's saying many of us here are pre-med students planning to pursue medicine in the future. However, some like your case might not end up choosing a clinical medical career. What is your advice for those of us who might deviate from their initial plans? You mean uh, whether you want to do a clinical medical career or basic research? Uh so this is related to a story you say in your book that uh, when you went to the ER, you decided you don't want to be a medical oh, doctor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. I, when I was in graduate school, the University of Minnesota started a program, MD-PhD program, uh, that was non-existent before. We're talking about a long time ago, 1962. And so I thought, oh, well, uh, maybe I should do the combined program. And although I love my research, uh, my research is always going to be a related to medicine. This is what I want to do. So why don't I get an MD and a PhD and maybe I can do a better job doing my research and maybe I'll want to look at patients as well. And so for my first rotation, I was in the emergency medicine and a, uh, an ambulance came in with uh, several patients in very bad shape. It was a motorcycle automobile accident and there was lots of blood. There were lots of exposed bones, okay? And I'm looking at that and uh, I had to excuse myself from the room. I mean, I literally ran out. I went into the men's room. I got sick. I came out. I tried to do the best I can. I came by the next day Something similar happened, although not so severe, but my hands just wouldn't function to help the patients. I, I couldn't get close to them. Then I realized that, you know, what I really, what is really dear to my heart in helping those people is, is not to touch them, but rather to do the basic research. Maybe I can make some discoveries that, that can help them in, in the long run without getting involved in the actual practice hands-on of medicine. And to this day, I have to tell you, to this day, if I see an accident, or if I see somebody fall and break an arm or bleed, I get sick to my stomach. So I think I made the right choice. I made the right choice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this uh, question is coming from Celine Mahdi. Uh, who is a, a biology student um, aiming to become a doctor, and she is a person who read your book and updated the entire team. Um, she is saying it's a fascinating book. She very much enjoyed reading it. What would you say about the importance of mentorship, reflecting back on those influential advisors who played an instrumental role in your career? Yes, okay, I, I can certainly speak to that. I, um, I am not a shy person. I, you know, I, I'm of an Italian heritage. Italians are not shy. So in the laboratory, if I needed some help with any part of my experiments, I always went out to look for help. I, not, I, I never tried to rediscover the wheel myself in the laboratory. If I knew there was an expert here who could help me with my work, I would go to them and say, listen, this is what I want to do. You have a method like this. I could really use expertise with that method in my lab. Could we work together or could one of your people show me, you know, how to do this? I mean, they were mentoring me. And I did this throughout my career. Uh, throughout my career, I went to the best sources th that I knew who were doing certain kinds of methodology that could help me with my work. And as it turns out, this is the fascinating thing, as it turns out, nine out of 10 of those people who 
helped me with my work, later went on to be awarded the Nobel Prize, either in chemistry or in medicine. While they were helping me, they did not have the Nobel Prize. But it's interesting how you know, I was able to, to get mentored by the experts in a given field. And clearly, they did a good job because my research was successful thanks to them. And I went on to get the Nobel Prize. So it's really important never to be shy and try to get as much information as you can from experts in the field. And always keep one thing in mind. You cannot do everything yourself. I don't care how smart you think you are. You can never do everything yourself. Be smart and go learn from other people who have become experts in their areas. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Leah Stetigi, biology student here at AUB. What did your mother think of your nickname as the father of Viagra? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she did not like that at all. You see, my, <laughs> my mother was born in Italy. Uh, she, she, was the, she was part of a family of seven people. She brought up her brothers and sisters. She married my father in New York. Uh, uh, she was chaperoned everywhere. She was the most innocent lady on the planet. You know, she married my, my father. She was, again, very, very sheltered kind of a person. And she would never talk about sex. She would never talk about how babies were born, even when I was 20. She never talked about anything. And then when she sees, she did not hear it from me first. She heard it from the television. She was watching television when the news came out about Viagra helping men to get an erection and that this research was discovered and made possible by Professor Lou Ignaro from UCLA. And she would scream out, my son did that? <laughs> and so at first she was really taken back by that. But then after a while, she realized, you know, I, I did something uh, important, but that we should not discuss it with the neighbors. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, Lynn Hijazi, biology student. Um, did you feel demotivated at some stages while writing your book? If so, what kept you going and motivated to explore and write? Well, uh, I, I, in writing my book, I, uh, I never felt depressed. Writing my book was really the greatest thing I could do because it made me, um, it made me think back. I was convinced after I finished my book that after 81 years, I'm 81 years of age, after 81 years of living on this planet Earth, I can still remember everything in the past. So I... I don't think I have Alzheimer's yet. I was able to recall everything. And the more I thought about it, the more detail I could, I could recall. So I loved writing the book. However, I mean, writing my research papers, writing my research grants, uh, uh, that's different. And of course, I had many, many um, depressing moments in, in writing those. Those were you know, much, much more, much more difficult to write. There were lots of set, setbacks, lots of criticisms I got from people who reviewed my grants, who reviewed my submitted publications and so on. So that was a different matter. This question is from Basim Al Harfani, a medical lab student. Um, his question, you mentioned in your book that your father, although uneducated, was always willing to encourage you and support your curiosity. How important is it for parents to nourish their child's curiosity and recognize and feed their talents? And to what extent can one's surrounding, either supportive or discouraging, and environment um, affect his, her life choices? I, I think I was lucky in this regard. This, and now that I reflect back on it, was so essential. You see, I had two different parents. My mother, she never encouraged me to do anything. She just wanted me 
to have good friends and not play around with the gangsters in Brooklyn and New York. So she was looking at that side. She wanted me to get good grades in school, which I eventually was able to do. But she had no concept of um, what science was all about. So she did not know how to encourage me to do science. But my father also had no idea what science was about. But he would listen to me. He would always listen to me. This started off when I wanted to make at the age of 10 years old, I wanted to make a firecracker. So he got me a chemistry set. I, I, I mixed, I made some gunpowder. You know, I'm not going to go over it in detail. And I made a firecracker. I lit it up. It blew up. It worked. He was very impressed that a 10-year-old could do that. My mother kicked me out of the house because she thought I was going to hurt myself. <laughs> well, this graduated to making little rocket ships and other things, which I won't get into. And it was destructive. And in every case, my mother was ready to disown me. But my father would pull me aside and say, look, Lou, just be careful. Don't hurt yourself. I like what you're doing. Please don't go overboard. Don't do anything to upset your mama. Just, just do it carefully. And then I did some other experiments with him that were not destructive. And, you know, he was impressed with my understanding of things that he never understood. And so he always gave me the benefit of the doubt and pushed me into the direction of more learning, greater learning, you know. And, and uh, that was important. If he didn't do that, uh, I may still have developed, but maybe more slowly, or maybe if both parents were against it, he may have discouraged me and I may have gone into something else. But at least I got one parent to really motivate me uh, uh, to, to go all the way. So I thank him for that. Uh, there are so many questions. I don't know how much time we can still have. Can we have 10 more minutes? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, but there are, uh, I, I read the book and I, as I said, I enjoyed it so much. And there are a couple of things I, I really um, wondered about, for instance, um, and, and I love your style of writing. Uh, and you mentioned in your book that uh, you had the coach, but she did not interfere in uh, with you in writing the book, that it was all yours at a certain time. She had to slow you down because yeah. you were making it almost <laughs> like a movie. Exactly. But there were, uh, there were uh, two stories that uh, attracted my attention. Well, there were so many, but two, I, I, if, you, if you don't mind to uh, comment on. The first one, how you announced to the whole world in a conference of experts that today, I got goosebumps when I, uh, I read it, when you announced, um, you are going to announce what is the structure of EDRF. And there was this gentleman yeah. at the back <laughs> of the lecture right. hall Everybody came at the end to to uh, congratulate you, but that guy left, and apparently yes. he published <laughs> the work before you. But <laughs> when you decided at the beginning, the, the, your opening was so amazing, the way you described it, that today I am going to announce the structure of EDRF, and you didn't say anything. You let everybody conclude that it is an oh. Right. And, 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 I, about this story? And, I, and I did it in a similar way that I showed you those slides uh, earlier. You know, I started off by, first of all, the name of the conference was the, um, uh, the uh, Vascular Endothelial Conference. That was the name of the five day meeting. It was at Rochester at the Mayo Clinic at Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm getting up to give my presentation and um, and uh, the, the title of my slide was a little bit different. So I, when I started, if I remember correctly, I told people that, uh, you know, we still don't know what the chemical identity is of endothelium-derived relaxing factor, the relaxing factor that Bob Furch got so beautifully um, uh, described. Uh, but today, uh, I'm going to reveal to you the chemical nature of EDRF. And of course, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, it got incredibly quiet in there. I could feel my heartbeat, you know, 
And I said, but I'm not going to tell you now. And in fact, I said, I'm not even going to tell you. I'm going to let you tell me what EDRF is by the time I'm finished with my lecture. <laughs> and so I took them through all of this logical development of the data and so on to the very last slide. And I said to the group, I says, well, what do you think EDRF is? And of course, they all said nitrous oxide and, and, and they didn't realize that it was going to get to, to that point. So I have to tell you that that was one of the most exciting lectures I ever gave because I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out to be. But I do remember um, uh, when the discussion started, everybody was raising their hand. They were starting to come down. But there was one gentleman who I'm not going to mention by name, but, but I knew him. He was working in the field, a very, very competitive person working in the field. He was up on the left-hand side on the top row. And as soon as the discussion started, he ran out of the room. And I figured, oh, I, I thought he was going to ask some pertinent questions. Why is he running so fast out of the room? I thought maybe I gave him an upset stomach and he had to go to the men's room. I mean, I don't know, didn't know what to believe. And then I found out a couple of years later that he made a phone call to his laboratory uh, to tell the group that uh, uh, it's, it, it looks like EDRF is nitric oxide, but it's not published yet. So please, I want you to do the experiments as quickly as possible so that we could publish it first. And, uh, you know, that's not the correct way to do science, okay? However, and yes, his, in the journal, nature appeared first, but mine appeared a couple of months later, but my work was submitted before his work, so that's one thing. And number two, number two, he heard me give my presentations. The Nobel Committee does not care if the revelation of your work is in a paper that appears in a journal or it's given at a meeting. This was a public meeting. I gave all the data that EDRF was NO, that was June 11th, 1986. Certain dates I never forget, okay? That was the date of the first publication and the rest is history. Thank you. Um, and the other uh, thing, um, you mentioned how much you enjoy teaching and uh, in one of your lectures to medical students, you were uh, talking about um, uh, the mecha well, you, you were talking about the effects of NO, but then one student asked you, you have been telling us all of this about NO, but what is the mechanism? And it was something that was always uh, bothering you. And you offered to that student, this is an excellent question, why don't you come and work in my lab on this? Yeah, and then she right. passed that opportunity. She said, I'm too busy with my medical uh, uh, studies. So my, the, the question, here is how important it is for students you have so many young uh, young minds in the audience how important it is for students to grab on such golden opportunities and not right. to pass uh, yes she could the, have uh, co-authored that paper would you? of course of course and then she could have gone on to get her md phd and and who knows what else i mean it's uh, sometimes when you do not, an established investigator has read thousands and thousands of publications and their minds are cluttered with billions of pieces of information. And then here you have medical students who are learning. So their minds are not cluttered with all this information. And sometimes I think they can see more clearly than we can. And she's sitting there. I was talking about um, uh, nitroglycerin as a vasodilator. And she didn't understand. She said, Professor, Professor Ignaro, 
how come it took over a hundred years to figure out, you know, how nitroglycerin works as a vasodilator, and we still don't know how it works. This was before I showed that it works through nitric oxide. And she says, I, I, I don't understand that. <laughs> and that really affected me. And I said, I said, young lady, um, I agree with you. The mechanism is not known, and there really is no good reason why the mechanism is still not known. I think we just need to go into the laboratory and look at this more carefully and try to figure out the mechanism. And I said to her, I says, you know, in the summer when you have free time, why don't you come into my laboratory? I will pay you for this. I'll give you a free lab bench and we can work together to try to figure out how nitroglycerin works. And she thought about it, but she, she had other plans, you know, for medical school during the summer and she couldn't do it. But it's Thank important you. to um, listen to question... the young, young people. And very important to listen to the young people, you know, always listen to what they have to say because they can be very, very bright. Thank you. This question is from Tayana Al Hashash. She is majoring in food science and management. You have uh, mentioned um, that a great scientist is one who jumps from one failure to another. Do you classify mm -hmm. yourself as one of them? Yes, yes. I I have uh, I've in been engaged in numerous failures throughout my experiments. Uh, if I if I formulate a hypothesis and the first three or four experiments work, then maybe the next one does not work. That means my hypothesis is wrong. And so I have to go back and correct my hypothesis. What many scientists do today, and, and I advise strongly against it, if they do several projects and they all agree, but then they find, they find a series of experiments that does not approve their hypothesis, they tend to ignore it and go find and do another experiment that supports it. That <laughs> so what are you after? Do you want to support your hypothesis or do you want the truth? So a scientist has to go after the truth. Don't look for something that supports your hypothesis. You will always find something that will support your hypothesis but in fact, you're wasting your time because your hypothesis is wrong. You know, I mean, that's the way it is. So uh, I have, have always said that uh, you should never let any kind of a failure uh, uh, get in, in, in your way uh, because life is filled with, uh, you know, with, with failures. And, you know, Winston Churchill, I think it was Winston Churchill who once said that uh, success is walking from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And that's what you have to do. And sometimes it's very difficult to do that. Sometimes it's difficult to do it and you have to do it. And sometimes you have to, you have to walk from failure to failure while you're trying to think originally and think outside the box. You know, it's, it's not always good to follow in the footsteps of others. Uh, it, it's, it's always good to, to go where there are no footsteps and, 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 and you know, I create a path for your own. This is being uh, novel, doing unique work and thinking outside the box. Not easy to do all the time, but certainly worth trying. Thank you. Uh, there are many good questions right here. Um, this uh, question is coming from a psychology student at the Lebanese American University. Oh. It is a sister university of American University of Beirut. His name is Shadi Masoud. He is asking about the chronic long-term effects of the increased nitric oxide in the atmosphere due to pollution. Does it cause more inflammation or anything similar? Yes. Well. <clears throat> Nitric oxide is certainly a pollutant uh, in the air. Uh, and uh, it seems to have been stabilized. The, the amount of nitric oxide in the air as a pollutant does not seem to be, to be uh, 
uh, going up. Nitric oxide likes to react with ozone in the air. And if there's too much nitric oxide, the ozone will destroy the NO. If there's too much um, NO, the o ozone destroys the NO and vice versa. So those two kind of go hand in hand. And there are a lot of, I think almost every country has instrumentation, in, environmental instrumentation to measure the content of nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, other oxides of, of nitrogen. So I think, uh, I think we're, we're, we're pretty safe. The most important thing to worry about, I think, is the uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, in, in the air, which can cause you know, long, -terms, uh, long term problems in terms of the greenhouse effect. But I wouldn't worry too much about the nitric oxide so far. Three more questions, yes. I promise. Okay. Lynn, Lynn Mugrabi, psychology pre-med student. Her question is, how did you react to NIH rejecting your proposal and refusing to fund your research? <laughs> how did you pick yourself up after such a discouraging setback? And what made you insist on carrying on with the experiments? Yes, okay, but very good. Well, I knew I was correct and I knew the NIH was incorrect, but that's not good enough. So. So what do I do? Uh, I would continue to apply for grants to support my other work because I had two different projects going on. So I raised money in the laboratory to support a different project. However, I used that money to do my nitric oxide research to advance it further. All I knew I had to do was a few more experiments so that I could publish the nitric oxide work in a few journals. They didn't have to be the best journals. They didn't have to be nature or science or cell. I just wanted to get the research out there so that other people could look at it and reproduce it and extend it further, okay? So I got several publications out other people were able to reproduce and extend the findings. And before you knew it, it was very clear that nitric oxide was a vasodilator, bronchodilator, inhibited platelet aggregation, increased blood flow. <clears throat> and then when I went back about a year and a half later with a modified NIH grant, I was able to get it funded because the word got out that, you know, maybe there is something to this nitric oxide. So that's how I had to do it. Uh, and, you know, I, I was gonna do it no matter what. I was not going to let that stop me because I knew deep down inside that that was an important molecule. You know, when you're a pharmacologist and you're a chemist and you study something, you can sense how important the molecule is. And, and, and you have to go further in order to prove that. Thank you. I really liked uh, that you included in your book that comment by the referee, how he was uh, talking about the research and that you lost your touch and uh, <laughs> perhaps you need to submit that. That's why I included it in my uh, opening remarks as well as in uh, uh, my announcement of, uh, of your talk. Uh, yeah. Fatima Sunji, chemical engineering student. Um, she said you refer to many Nobel laureates winners in your book. Yeah. Who affected your career the most and why? The most. Well, you know, they, they, they all did. Um, and so if you're asking me who did it the most, I, I would say it's a, a person that I actually did not interact with while I was doing my research. The, the Nobel laureates I talked about, were, I was working with during my research. But when I was in high school, before I started research, I met a very famous Nobel laureate. His name was Linus Pauling, one of the greatest chemists of all time. And, and I met him in high school. He came to visit our high school to help, help us set up a chemistry laboratory during the third year of high school. He was there for several days. 
and we were chatting back and forth. Uh, I knew my chemistry, the other students did not, and he sort of realized that I really understood my chemistry. And so we went back and forth, and he would ask me questions, I would answer questions. <clears throat> but what I noticed about him is, despite being so smart, he was able to, to talk about chemistry at a level that everyone could understand it. In other words, he was a great, great teacher. And he was able to teach us the practical importance of chemistry, that everything on our planet is based on chemistry. And he did experiments to show that. And, you know, he was just a, a, a he was full of admiration. He, uh, it's, he's somebody I really enjoyed uh, speaking with. He came across as being very knowledgeable, very humble. And I told him that I wanted to have a, a, a career in chemistry and biology, that I was interested in both, and that I wanted to combine them. And he's the one who suggested to me that you should definitely think about going into uh, pharmacology or chemical pharmacology. And, and that's what I did. So he was the most influential to get me off the jumping board you know, to get started. And then I had some other key people help me uh, all along, probably equally. Uh, the last question, but before okay. I read the last question, um, I, I teach organic chemistry here at AUB, ah, organic okay. one and organic two. And most of my students are pre-medical students and they are very competitive and they think it is the end of the world if they don't do well in one exam. So here you are, you are telling us about all the setbacks, and that will get me to the last question of Selina Bujaudi, who is a coordinator of my transformative education team. She's saying, what kept you motivated to work despite the numerous setbacks and negative comments? Well, uh, I, I formulated certain ideas when I was uh, younger. The most important idea I formulated when I was in high school, I noticed that many of my friends in the neighborhood, uh, the older people died of heart attack, stroke, they had diabetes at a very young age of maybe 45 or 50, and yet other people lived till 70 or 80. And I also noticed that uh, the people who got sick were not eating correctly and they were not moving around, they were leading a sedentary lifestyle, whereas all the ones living a ripe old age were very active and eating, from what I could tell, healthy food. And so I just raised the question, even to my physicians in, the, in my neighborhood, that maybe some people make a molecule that protects them against cardiovascular disease, whereas other people don't make enough of this molecule and are not as well protected against cardiovascular disease. So I thought that was a good hypothesis and I kept that throughout my early research. And every once in a while I'd do an experiment which kind of supported that. And then when I got uh, into the nitric oxide field, which was very early in my career, I realized that nitric oxide could be that molecule. But that was a time when no one believed it could exist in the body because it was too reactive. But I pursued it anyway. I kept studying the nitric oxide, even though the NIH said, why are you doing this? I kept pursuing nitric oxide, even though I couldn't get it published, because I knew there was something there that was going to be turn out to be important in our bodies. So when we demonstrated that nitric oxide was produced in, in the bodies, that's when I realized that all these decades, I was correct. There is a molecule that protects us against cardiovascular disease. And now because of my perseverance and motivation, we discovered it was nitric oxide. So you just, if you believe in something, you just have to keep going, but you have to have the motivation and the enthusiasm to keep going. That's the best I could do. 
Thank you so much. I want to say that during uh, your talk, uh, uh, Yusuf Jaffa from my team has been tweeting live and tagging you, tagging Lauren, tagging me, Anguanta, and AUB. I didn't have the chance to retweet, but our uh, uh, Twitter ha has been on, uh, on, on fire the last hour or so. Okay. On behalf of all uh, attendees, I want to sincerely thank you, Professor Ignaro, for honoring us with your presence and for your time. And um, I look forward to hosting you here in person in our beautiful campus at the American University of Beirut. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us. Uh, big thanks to Angewanta for being our partner on uh, uh, hosting you and other future Nobel laureates whom we will announce in the future.